All right, so we'll just get things going here because I know you're all here to, to listen to Dr. Bruce Damer and not me. So I'm just going to hand the microphone right over to Dr. Paul Michel. He's the Executive Director of Indigenous Education, and he's going to open this uh, presentation in a good way. White to white, Paul Michel, Nekel Moose Esquess, Sequatmaka has Stalin, Ketchkaka, Joe Michel, he welched. Kichka and Michelle Yilkwatkwa. My name is Paul Michelle. I'm the Executive Director for Indigenous Education. My traditional name is Nekalmus. I'm from the community of Adams Lake, Hustalan. So I'm part of this uh, territory here. Uh, before I start my prayer, I do want to acknowledge we're on the traditional territory of Takamups to Sequatmok, a part of Sequatmok Ulu, part of the unceded territory of the Sequatmok people. And uh, if you can please stand, I'm going to say some good words to start our, start our presentation by Dr. Bruce Damer. Kokshjam kel kokbi, kokshjam slaa, kokshjam kea, kokshjam imch, kokshjam temich, kokshjam selkwa, kokshjam kel kokbi. This is a very humble prayer to begin. I thank the grandfathers, I thank the grandmothers. I thank the grandchildren. I also thanked the earth, and I thank the waters. And then once again, I thank the Great Spirit. Ho, oh, all my relations. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Paul, for starting us in a good way. Um, it's my pleasure, my name is Tom Dickinson, to welcome you here. This is part of our science seminar series that we hold in the Faculty of Science, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Bruce Damer. Uh, I met Bruce yesterday. Uh, for the very first time, we were walking out in the campus, and I immediately knew who he was. Uh, and uh, we had a wonderful chance to chat and to uh, share some stories, and I know you're going to be excited today. Um, by hearing about things that are the foundation of the world, and things that are out of this world. And I'll t give you just a few moments of uh, acknowledgement about uh, Bruce's background. And I especially want to acknowledge uh, Nancy Beppel, because Nancy uh, is the reason we were able to bring Bruce here today, because she nominated him. And uh, I also want to thank Jim Hebda, because he turned him on to a uh, career in science. And uh, I heard all about that yesterday. And you may hear a little bit more today. But anyway, Bruce grew up uh, and did his early schooling in Kamloops. After that, he came and did his first two years in Caribou College. And Derek and Wes, you guys were instrumental in getting him into the idea of computing science in a day when computing science really wasn't a science yet. And uh, uh, gave him insights into his career. But it was his own intellectual processes that kept him going in it. And he was telling me about hiking in the hills above uh, Royal Inland Hospital and getting ideas about how to capture uh, co uh, meteors and, uh, and asteroids. And so um, it's one of our great pleasures to be able to acknowledge one of our earliest alumni and the career successes he's had. He followed up from his transfer program here down to University of Victoria, ultimately getting a, a PhD in University College Dublin and, uh, and has uh, subsequently developed a wonderful career at University of California, Santa Cruz, as a research scientist. And so you don't want to listen to me talk, so I'm going to hand you over to Bruce. Bruce? Thank you, Tom. Uh, I just want to acknowledge and thank all of you. Many of you in this room were instrumental in my life uh, as teachers, as, as parents, as neighbors. And I just want to acknowledge what a special community Kamloops is. I mean, people sort of drive through Kamloops and because of our wonderful bypass, you know, unlike Kelowna, uh, they kind of, it whizzes past, but it's just a remarkable place. There's so much ecological diversity. There's so many landscapes, there's so many views, there's so much vision in Kamloops. And for me, when our family moved here in 1968, it went, we went from kind of a, a suburban Victoria uh, lifestyle to suddenly these open skies and countries and sagebrush hills and everything. And it was a totally different world when we came here in 68. And uh, it, was, it was a really big moment for me because I could then walk for 
five miles in, in any direction and see nature and different, different ecosystems. And that's where my passion for biology and life started, was here in Kamloops. And I'll give you a little bit of, uh, uh, I want to dedicate this talk to Enid and Warren Damer, who many of you uh, know or taught with, or maybe you were students of, or maybe you attended Enid's uh, pottery classes, or Warren was in scouting. Uh, just a beautiful couple of human beings who adopted me at birth in Victoria in 1962, brought me home, uh, and that was another stroke of magic for me to be adopted by Ian and Warren Damer. So it all started in Kamloops. This is Kamloops in, gosh, 1976 or something like that. It's a lot more brown and sepia-toned at the time, but, <laughs> but uh, a lot less developed, a lot less construction. And we first moved to Kirkland Place in the North Shore. There's me in 1969, all excited about the moon landing that was gonna be that year. And I saw it on a black and white TV at Chuswap Lake in the Phillips cabin, another principal's cabin. And that's what turned me on to space. That's me on my first bike. And there's our famous yellow Suburban <laughs> in front of 112, in front of a, a Kirkland Place. Uh, house and this this uh, yellow suburban found its way up into Zahali and 112 Arrowstone Drive, which is now surrounded by other things, but it was just sort of sitting on a pile of dirt in 1972. And here's uh, Susan on the left, me in the middle, and Eric on the right, uh, the three kids, and we're still looking for these stripy shirts. So if you've seen them in a in a bin somewhere, the, <laughs> we'd like to recreate. Uh, Susan wants to recreate, and Susan's here, sitting right here. She wants to recreate this photo. We will look different. <laughs> and of course, all the wonderful things happening in scouting and outdoors in this community was just great. This is scouting, <laughs> probably like 78, 79. So it all started in Kamloops. And I was walking in Sagebrush Hills, uh, not these hills, but out behind uh, Royal Inland one day in 1976, noticed a Mariposa lily coming up. And this is probably about two, three weeks from now, you know, all those years ago. And I thought, well, what is this beautiful, complicated thing in geometry? What, where did it come from? Well, it came from a bulb or a seed. In the case of Mariposa lilies, it's a, it's a bulb. But it seems like a simpler thing making a more complicated thing. And I thought there must be some process by which this happens. And then I recalled reading about this fellow, Albert Einstein. And he was a 16-year-old when he started doing these thought experiments where he'd go into his imagination. He was running alongside a beam of light to see what happened because he was interested in physics. And I thought, well, that's how you do science. You do these imaginative thought experiments. And I, I started to walk back toward Arrowstone Drive and realized, oh, this origin of life thing. Where did all of life come from? Because all of those bulbs and seeds had a common bulb and seed at some point. How did this happen? And I thought, this is the coolest problem to work on. And I'll just work on this problem my whole life. Might be able to do 80 years of it if I live to 94. And as soon as I committed to that, this came into my imagination. And I sketched it out later. And it was a seething bundle of molecules. And I was like, what are these? They looked like tinker toys, you know. And I was about to ask, I thought, well, this is a thought experiment. This is what happens. You pose a problem, you get a thing that comes into your imagination. And, and I realized I could sort of talk to it. So I was about to talk to it. I was about to say, where did life start? I mean, what, is the, what are the gears that had to turn to do this? And instead it asked me the question, <clears throat> figure out how, to, how I made a copy of myself. And I thought, mm, that doesn't make sense because a car, an automobile, needs a factory to make a copy of another automobile. You need a big machine to make a little machine copies of it. And I said to it, well, it doesn't make sense, that question. Because I don't see another big machine around you making copies. And it winked and said, work on it. And the solution came 38 years later, after long consideration. <clears throat> uh, but 40 years later, this is what we were doing. Yeah, let's get the samples in. Yeah. There we go. Okay, let's take another measurement. The laws of chemistry and physics are universal. So it's a given 
that uh, when we go to another Earth-like planet with water, with the sorts of uh, minerals that we have here, an iron core, an atmosphere, it's inevitable that this kind of simple chemistry would have been present. Okay, it's uh, 15 degrees up here. Let's see what this little guy has for us. As long as there's a chance for energy to interact with that mixture, things will happen. Wow, look at that. One degree, keep pulling up. The question that we are heading for right now, how certain can we be that that mix of simple chemistry could take the next step in complexity? So life could begin. In the hydrothermal fields of Bumpers Hill, California, all the ingredients of life are brought together. Water, carbon molecules, energy, minerals. Careful of the end not coming off. Biologists David Diemer and Bruce Damer believe this is the kind of environment where life could get started on another world. Bubbling pools, strange colored rocks, water of different pHs, all kinds of flows and dynamics, steam rising. It looks like nature's chemistry set. And it's an engine, an actual engine for the beginning of a living system. Conditions like this defined the early Earth. Evidence of similar environments has been found on Mars. And researchers expect hydrothermal fields to be a common feature of Earth-like exoplanets. But how might nature's chemistry set cook up the recipe of life? Everything that's alive is in fact based on polymers. Everybody knows the name, DNA, nucleic acid, that's one of the polymers. Proteins, these are uh, amino acid polymers. And th that's basically the start of all life, are those two polymers. So what we're doing is taking small molecules, the pieces of a polymer, called monomers in fact, and we're exposing them to energy, such as you see here at Bumpus Hill, and seeing where that energy is sufficient to make those monomers link up one after another after another to make a polymer. And in fact, if we can make a protein-like molecule and a nucleic acid-like molecule and put it into a little wrapper, a compartment, we've, we're on the way. We call those protocells. Each sample contains organic molecules, or monomers, exposed to the mineral-rich steam and heat energy of the fumarol in an attempt to form a protocell. We think that drying out, such as you see all around us here at Bumpus Hill, water coming in, then drying out, coming in, drying out, that's a cycle. We think that that cycle was very important to drive the uh, process by which polymers are synthesized and then accumulate. Let's go for it. Failure. Are you sure? Yeah, there's nothing left. Put it down here to yeah. cool. The first experiment yeah. fails, just as it would do many times on an Earth-like exoplanet. But if all the elements were present in conditions such as this, this experiment in life would repeat again and again. Uh, but some of them got a lot of liquid in them. Ah, so one last try. Given enough time, and keep in mind, we have an entire planet with lots of volcanic land masses coming up, uh, with lots of puddles like this trying to learn how to become alive. Mostly it's failures, but it would only take a few successful protocells that happen to be able to survive and had learned how to make more of themselves. So go ahead and get them into the uh, boxes. Is the universe made to make life? This is a, a huge question that sort of 
beyond the scope of perhaps humans to be able to answer. But what we can observe is everything comes down to cycling. It comes to rhythms and overlapping rhythms and patterns. And it's almost as though if you get the right cycling and patterning in a system, it learns how to do that itself and how to lift itself into being. And so perhaps that's the closest metaphor that we know that the geology gave us that ability. The moon going around the earth gave us tides. The rotation of the earth gives us days and nights. Rainfall into these hydrothermal fields gives us geysers that are periodic. And life still follows rhythmic patterns. That's the clue we have. So perhaps it's the universal harmonic that creates life. So that's uh, some of our field work that we've been doing the last three years where we get out of the lab, out of lab coats and glassware, and we go out into the actual hot springs where we think life can start and try it there. And you're gonna see a little bit more later from the trip to New Zealand last year, which was had some dramatic successes. But the origin of life, as far as science was concerned, really started with Charles Darwin's little phrase here you can read uh, from his a letter to his friend in, in 1871. And he talks about, oh, if, and what a big if, we could conceive some warm little pond somewhere with all the right chemicals and energy, et cetera, et cetera. And everyone knows that phrase. They know warm little pond. Like, that's the famous phrase. But the second part of it is where we're focused, that a protein compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changes. And Darwin nailed it. This is called away from equilibrium chemistry. You make a protein compound with a string of things and, they, and you grow the string and you make it more complex. And so in 1871, he really kind of had nailed it. In our field, our field for the last 125 years went to all these, what we call sort of in a way, chemical cul-de-sacs. Well, let's explore soups and operans, uh, primordial soup. And then Miller and Urey sparked spark chambers of of atmosphere and made amino acids and everybody got excited about those for years. And then in 1977, when I was at, at Sahali Junior, I remember them discovering these deep sea hydrothermal vents, these black smokers, you remember that on TV. And so it was thought for a while that life could start there, but it just never really worked. The chemistry didn't work because the water just dissipates everything and breaks it down. So our field finally with Dave and my work and others went back to pools on land. And that's what you're gonna see. And we've, we've hit some real pay dirt. So in order to search for Darwin's warm little pond, uh, we decided to take a amazing bus tour, a bus trip. Bus trips are the things you do now, right? Except there's no bus service to Kamloops anymore, I heard. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, get on the bus. And uh, Dave and I decided to go on this, uh, what, are, what was called the field trip to the Archean, a field trip back three billion years. And we took a bus uh, with a group of uh, astrobiologists, geologists from the University of New South Wales up here to Shark Bay, which is a saline estuary on the West Coast, very famous for scuba diving. And we dove uh, with the stromatolites, these, these domes that were, some of them under the water, some of them poking up out of the water. And these are not rocks, they're made by life. I mean, they're minerals, but they're made by layering of something called microbial mats that layer and layer and layer and cement sand grains together. And you can push your finger on the top of them and it's all spongy. And this was, they were determined to be some of the oldest uh, sort of living forms going all the way back as far as we can look, stromatolites. So we then pressed on past huge bulls and huge camel herds, strange place, Australia, and jumping kangaroos would jump over the bus. Uh, it, they, literally, there are these bars that come up in front of the driver so that if the, if the roux jumps too late, it bounces off <laughs> the bars and doesn't come in. Uh, amazing landscape. But we went up to the place, this place called the Pilbara, 
And this is a very special part of it. It's called North Pole Dome, just because it's so remote. There's our bus. And in that landscape, every sand grain you're, look, you're, you're crunching your feet on is over 3 billion years old. It's the biggest piece of Earth's crust that's preserved. And there's some of the geology. And there, everywhere, on these outcrops are these stromatolites. But they're not the living ones at Shark Bay. They're the ancient ones. And what I'm going to do is to pass one around. So this is... This, this was a very special stromatolite. I picked this up three years ago in the, out of the Tumbiana Formation, and here it is. This is three billion years old, and those little ridges there are the layers laid down by our deepest ancestors, uh, microbial mats. I think I'll start it out over here. You guys look keen. <laughs> so just pass it around, and, and when, as you, you pick it up, feel how heavy it is because it was, the earth was full of iron in those peri that period of time. And life was just starting to oxidize it. But this is from a lake shore, so it's a mudstone. But that's the oldest thing you'll probably ever hold in your hand. Because there isn't much of it left on, on the earth today that's exposed. Stromatolites. So here's a couple in cross-section up here. Here's some embedded in something called chert which is this black material. And if you thin slice it, you can find individual preserved microfossils, cellular microfossils. They're very rare. But this is what goes on in Northwest Australia, these field seasons to this very ancient landscape. And so there's the, there's the, the layering of the stromatolites. <clears throat> there I am, that was the picture they used for the poster. That's at me at Strelly Pool Chert. So what's happened at the same time as Dave and I were coming up with a chemical model of wet dry cycling, our colleagues were, were mapping the rock record and they discovered a hot spring preserved, three and a half billion year old hot spring. It's that thing in the upper left, all those striations. I discovered this about three years ago. It was uh, another mineral spring preservation of, of life. And here's a bit of this uh, lakeshore stuff and here's the living stuff. So if you actually track the rock record, the fossil rock record, you can track a, a vibrant life in hot springs as far back as we can look on land, and you can track how they spread out through lake systems, et cetera, and ended up on seashores. That was suggesting that life started inland at the hot spring and then went flowed down toward the sea. And another body of evidence has come in at the same time, and this is how revolutions in science occur. You get multiple lines of evidence and multiple independent groups coming up with their stuff, and then you meet them at meetings and you go, oh my goodness, we never thought of that. And you're, so one of the revolutions in science now is exoplanets, these solar systems out there where you've got the, you can even see the formation disks when they're like they're depicted there, very dusty and full of organic compounds. And so now we know that Earth at the time of the origin of life had enormous, almost like snowfalls of organic compounds from space landing on the Earth and concentrating in these pools. And there's a, another paper just came out with wet, dry cycling. So there were things like this, Murchison. It was a very famous meteorite. And this comet nucleus that was visited by the Europeans just a few years back, and it's 40% organic compounds. And at the end of the talk, I probably won't hand this out, but if you want to come up and you have a few more questions, in here I have a, an exudate, ground up exudate of, of a 4.6 billion year old uh, meteorite called the Murray meteorite. And we put it in chloroform and, and all the organics came out and they're all plastered on the bottom here. Give it a whiff and you're smelling the early solar system. It's the oldest vintage you'll ever take a whiff of. It's fantastic. It's a deep, smoky, gunpowdery smell. And it, can, it has all the building blocks of the living world in it. So come up later and give it a whiff. So putting it all together, when you have stuff falling from the sky, if it falls into the ocean, it dissolves and it's lost. If it falls on pools on land, it can concentrate and, and engage in chemistry. So this is, we did this model, this computer graphic model of the pools we think were around on these big volcanic landmasses four billion years ago, complete with camera splatter. 
So there you have a geyser going off and a pulse of water comes out because geysers are very re repetitive, periodic, pouring out of that in, in this strange red landscape with a pink sky, no oxygen, and the pools would have looked like this. We find evidence of these pools on Mars as well in our Mars 2020 project. And so what we think is that on the very edges of these pools, a bathtub ring of chemicals will form and that this is where life can start. So we're going to zoom in and, and be under this rock. And so right about there, nice shaded area so the, the chemistry isn't blown up, blown up by ultraviolet radiation. So the landscape's a powerful, uh, in a sense, a computational system. You have all these pools, you have flows between the pools. And each pool has different properties. And this one particular here might be what we call the Goldilocks chemistry. You know, Goldilocks is not too hot and not too cold. And so this one would be just right for prebiotic chemistry to happen. And then the chemistry of life can start and life can start and then it can adapt later to the salty seashore, which is a lot harder for chemistry to, to happen later. So the, life can do all, the land can do all these things. It can concentrate things, cycle them, distribute them around adapt them, just as it does now when seeds blow from trees, you know, or spores move around. It's the same thing that's going on now, but in the pre-living world. So here's another piece of evidence that came in. This is from our lab. What Dave discovered was, when we built this, uh, this funny gadget here to test it, this disc that can contain vials, like, the, like these vials, goes around very slowly underneath a dehydration station, which pushes air at it, and a hydration station puts a drop in the, in, the, in the vial. What we found is we hydrated and dehydrated the solutions. They did the following magic trick. So if we added lipid, which is kind of like soap in your bubble bath, it, it came down to, when it dried down, it formed these films everywhere in the bottom of the dishes. It's like a bathtub ring. In between the films, you can see the little building blocks of polymers, which are what make us work, would stitch together without having life. So it was a way to answer the chicken and egg problem. You can make your polymers without having life to make them because it can be made by drying them down. And we tested through, this is called gel electrophoresis, and on the right that little thing is our nanopore uh, sequencing technology. And we determined we were making polymers of RNA, which is a very important uh, polymer for life, we were making them in abundance and in great lengths. And other groups started doing this and they started making peptides, which are made from your Bragg's amino acids, basically, <laughs> you know, in, in abundance as well. So we thought we'd found a way by which nature can boot up uh, the living world. So uh, at one point, a geologist in the front row, a cranky fellow named Steve, who's the, he's the, I am the guy in the front row asking the, the annoying questions challenged me in Japan and said, your system will never work in hot springs. I know hot springs. I've worked in them 40 years and so, so and so will break down this product and such and such will mean you can't form the little ves vesicles you want to do. So I tried, trudged out to Yellowstone. We got a permit, went to this hot spring, pulled the waters out and started to do the chemistry uh, with this hot spring water. And you can sort of see how there's, there's actually no life in that pool, but then the orange stuff is, is life that is eating chemicals uh, as it gets cool enough for it to survive. There's more chemical eating life, and then finally it goes green all around in the, in the plain. So this is what I saw. This was basically this cloudy stuff formed, which turned out to be our compartments that, we, what the, that the, the, uh, the uh, geologist said, you'll never work. So there they are, the compartments. We wet dry cycled them and we got RNA to be captured inside them. And then we took seawater on the right from just from Santa Cruz and filtered it, tried it, and it crystallized everything. There was no compartments. So this is how you do things in science. Somebody challenged you, you do the work, and I sent Steve the paper and he said, I read it four times and I'm just blown away. It wasn't supposed to work and it did. You go out and test it. You always have to test the ideas. So then we got very, very excited about working in the field and we started to uh, plan a trip to New Zealand and we're gonna show you what happened there. You can kind of ignore the, all the details here. 
but we, we milled out a, a block of aluminum and put our little vials in there, set them down in the hot spring pool, and then we use acidic water to hydrate and, and dehydrate them over four or five hours. And it almost completely blew my system out. It was just, uh, I had no idea that there was so much sulfuric acid in the environment. But it worked. Here's our little bathtub ring, there's our little films, and we made RNA polymers. And let's take a look how that, that came. So the New Zealand Herald came one day and wonderfully captured this uh, document. It's just a case of weird science. Leading American scientist Dr. Bruce Dahmer is at Rotorua's Hell's Gate, conducting research trials aiming to answer the age-old question, how did we get here? It's very exciting. It's 21st century science, revolutionary science to watch. Uh, if we can find this cycle, it's the engine of creation effectively. Also that we're, we came not from an individual, not from competing individuals, uh, but from a network, a collaborative community was at the tap root of the tree of life. Dr. Damer's research could turn previous origins of life science on its head. He's testing whether hot springs on land may have been the starting point for life itself. Dr. Damer's searching for RNA, a nucleic acid, and the basis of all living cells. So what we think is that RNA could have been the first polymer that life synthesized first at random in a process like this and then picked through selection through these cycling protocells which we're doing here in the hot spring picked ones that worked he's for years scientists had accepted the theory that life began in hydrothermal vents in the ocean Charles Darwin once speculated that biological molecules might form in a warm little pond, and Dr. Damer believes this to be much closer to the truth. If we can show to our, our colleagues and to the world that we can self-assemble an important biopolymer of life called RNA in a hot spring pool that's cycling, in the conditions that would have been around in the early Earth on these big volcanic islands, our colleagues are really going to seriously look at doing more experiments. And it'll create a whole movement, a whole sort of paradigm shift in origin of life thinking back to Darwin's warm little pond, only now it's a cycling hot little pool. Jaden McLeod, Local Focus. So uh, from that experiment, we shipped off our samples to Copenhagen, Denmark, because science is so international, right? And our colleague just donated his time to run a special microscope called an atomic force microscope over the samples, and this is what he saw. And we just couldn't believe it. He, he sent these images back. That fibril in the center uh, is our RNA polymer, but it's immense. So if any of you are sort of in the, in the chemistry area, this is about, I'd say, 100, 200, 300, it's probably three to four, 500 nanometers in length if you stretch it out, which means it's 3,000 units linked together. It's immense, it's enormous. Much better than we ever got in the lab, which is surprising because in, when you take things out into nature and you've got all these complicated factors, you, you expect less productivity in chemistry. This was, it was vastly more. Uh, and we don't, we initially dis, we chose to disbelieve this, sent more samples, we got similar results. Some of them were bun, you know, in blobs. And then the most amazing image came last week. We got an image from another sample that had been sort of stored for longer, and they were all circles. They, were, they had all the ends had connected, and they were all circularized. And it was like nature saying, you think, you, you don't know if that fibril is a, is, a, is a nucleic acid polymer? Let me show you that it is, because the only thing that could do that is, is RNA. So, you know, we're kind of stunned. I mean, Dave, uh, this image and, and this, the circular ones may end up on the cover of the major magazine, Science and Nature, at some point. We're just trying to absorb what, what just happened. So, given that you can do that, you can make the polymers of life in a natural setting, and you can get them inside the little protocells, which you can see on the left, you set up a natural roulette wheel that has all the balls rolling around on it landing on, you know, the green thing or wherever they're supposed to land for you to win something. So I thought, well, I'm a computer science geek. I study with, uh, with uh, Derek and Wes here starting at, at Caribou. I got completely obsessed. And of course, Caribou had these uh, 
primitive computers at the time that took in paper tape. Actually, the PDP-11 did take in paper tape, I think. Uh, but the primitive computers, uh, the early ones, took in these punched paper tapes, they're the hobbyist machines. And so I thought, well, what if you had a random tape puncher? All you had was a random tape puncher. Could you write programs with it? You can in the following scenario. You, write, you run out a huge number of random paper tapes. You re have a simple reader, reads them into your primitive computer. This is an Altair 8800, because so I have a barn full of these things in California. I collected everything. Uh, it's got an energy source. It runs the programs, which are just gobbledygook. Most of them end up in the crash trash, because they don't do anything. But some do something, like turn a light on on the front of the machine. Cool. So it turns the light on. You run it back through the paper tape, so program A, and add more random programs onto the end of it. And then run it back into the computer. And it might turn on another light, but it might take thousands of them to turn two lights on. That's fine, because you've got lots of paper tape and lots of little random computers. But over time, you could evolve a more advanced computer. There's a couple programs stitched together with a couple million other programs, maybe evolves the hardware. So you get the laptop and then you get the smartphone. And it's the evolution of software and hardware together. Now we pay people called engineers who are slightly more efficient than this uh, to, to do this for us. So we don't just use random, that's a, that's a jab at fellow engineers. Um, are slightly more efficient than random. Uh, anyway, where do you find this system in nature? Well, you find it. You find the, the punched paper tapes are your polymers coming in from your organics from space and squished together by these layers of lipids and making the paper tapes, which is the polymers, which get read into our computer, which is the warm little cycling pool. There's our Charlie Darwin there. And it's got its energy source and it's, it's uh, cycling. And it makes programs called protocells, little bags that have random polymers in them. And Charlie comes in again, natural selection, and they either crash or they either pop or they do not. So something to do with the squiggly polymer holds together the bag it's in, it gets selected. Simple. Evolution of software and hardware together in chemistry. So we've got a cycle, and I, I sometimes call this a genesis engine because it's working now in the lab. It's actually what's giving us those long stringy things. So we're, first we have dry, and there's our dried lipid, it, was, it looks like under, in a freeze fracture. Then we add a drop of water, and we get budding off of these trillions of compartments. There's the wet, and that, the, wet, the wet tests the compartments, testing of the stability of the compartments. Then we have a sludge that forms at the bottom. So if you had your bubble bath and you put your thing in, and the bubbles that were still stable would form this nice sludge at the bottom of your bubble bath or your jacuzzi. And that's the, the survivors. So they get delivered into this little bottom phase, which we call the gel, or we call it now the Woe's Progenote. Because there was a scientist in the 1970s that predicted that there was a unit that took the simplest little protocells all the way to the living world, and that unit was called the progenote. And I later presented it to his graduate student, George Fox. And he said, you found the progenote. So now we're using Carl Woese's term, progenote, that we're on the path of the progenote, the roots of the tree of life. So let's put it all together. This is my favorite drawing. I was also a cartoonist. I did a lot of art for Kamloops News and with Mel Rothenberger and did tons of cartoons. I don't know if you remember these cartoons, but it, really helped for science because I could sketch things out really accurately. And then my artist in Australia, Brian Norcus, could do it point for point in beautiful renderings. So I sketched this landscape, it's about two years to do this, and put it all together. So here we have the synthesis of organics in space. They're falling into the atmosphere, they accumulate on the land into pools, they start forming organics on the left you can see. They concentrate and they share and mix across pools. You get more organics. Then a supply of them finds its way into a cycling pool driven by a geyser. On, off, up, down, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. It's the engine you need. Life can then begin. It can be lifted into existence by this engine. The progenotes where it starts, it, the progenotes are flowing out of the pool into other pools. They're flowing back into the original pool. They're donating their 
innovations, there are molecular innovations across the landscape and getting more robust, which is still what happens in nature, they flow into a lake. Now the lake, there's almost nothing to eat. So what do they have to do? Feed from the sky. They have to capture sunlight and make their own building blocks. It's called photosynthesis, photoautotrophy. So they go green, that's so what we made them go green. So somewhere in there, life begins, i.e. the protocells are no longer blobs that are like your bubble bath, they're actually self-dividing. They, they get all the technology together to pull themselves apart and by gosh, pass their simple genes on. So the transition to life occurs in here. Eventually they, they go down to the salty seashore and by gosh, they have to be really tough at dealing with salt. Because salt, when, when you eat a bag of chips that's salty, what do you do? drink a lot of water right away because your body has to get rid of that salt. So life can't start in the ocean because it needs high tech things called active pores to push salt out, to keep the salt levels low in the cells or the chemistry doesn't work anymore. So what we do is we eventually get adaptation to the seashore and global colonization. And this is all mapped in the rock record. So there's our hot spring, our lake shore, and our seashore stromatolites, and this is the tangled roots of the tree of life before we get the common sort of what are called prokaryotes. So this was all announced to the public in this wonderful article in Scientific American a couple, about a year and a half ago. They've just republished it actually. And this is what they did to the diagram, this wonderful work. They, they tilted it on its side and then they, they created this wonderful uh, wet dry cycling spiral starting from the inside and gradually getting more complex on the outside. And that little wedge opening up is the sludges, the progenote, the bathtub sludge that we became us. It's such an ignoble beginning. So this is a new diagram that Dave and I have just produced for a, a, a conference in Cambridge next week where I'm gonna link the origin of life into evolutionary biology itself. And this is the kind of diagrams they like. So how does the origin of life instruct us on how life evolved over three billion years, this is a prediction that an origin of life on land is so much more direct to where we get land plants. Because we can develop photosynthesis right away, because you're always exposed to the sunlight, you're, you've got access to all these pools, and you have clumping aggregates of things. Protocells that just nuzzle, you know, nestle together for protection. So. It, in truth, what we may have discovered is there was never a common ancestor of life that was an individual that was struggling against other individuals. There was only a common community. There was a common aggregate in a network effect of sharing, that that was the unit at, at the base of, of life. And in fact, that's the only unit that's survivable in life today. That may be a whole new philosophical dimension to the work. If life starts in the ocean, it's fighting uphill. It's fighting dis dispersion rather than ag aggregation and accumulation and concentration. The little protocells uh, have nothing to eat in the bulk of the ocean. They can't develop uh, photosynthesis until they reach the surface, but they can't develop because they were in the dark ocean. So it's a really, really difficult uh, path to get to the land plants when you, if you started in the ocean. It's probably impl implausible. So this is the argument we'll make next week. So implication number two is where do you look for life on other worlds? I was part of the Mars 2020 site selection process. It's a, it's a big rover, you can see it there. It's about the size of a Cooper Mini and it's launching in a year and a half and it's gonna look for life. It's the first large mission that's gonna look for evidence for life. We had debated for three years that they should go back to Columbia Hills, which is where the Spirit rover found an old hot spring. We weren't picked. Um, there's a whole process, there's only one rover, not two, and there's a huge amount of careers at stake that want to go to new sites, not old ones. But Spirit dragged its, uh, its bum left wheel through the Mars soil and turned up this white powder, which is not uh, snow, it's actually what's called opaline silica. So we know that that's a hot spring. So we wanted to go back there and break rocks and look for what you're passing around here, look for stromatolites. And what we also found was these little digitate uh, things on the ground that looked like what hot springs produce. But we didn't get picked. So we're actually designing a subsequent mission for the 2030s. But somebody at a meeting said, well, if you have an actual hypothesis, a testable 
hypothesis for how life can begin. Can this work on Titan? Can it work with crystals? Can it work with other chemistries? So I thought about this for a long while and said, life to, to, to get life started, you still need polymers. No matter what, you need polymers. Can crystals form polymers? No. Is Titan too cold? Is there any chemistry that will work on in the Titan seas to form polymers? Uh, our colleagues at NASA say maybe, maybe not. But you need to also encapsulate them in little protocells and then generate them in huge quantities and select them. You need a roulette wheel system. So it really isn't anything other than aqueous carbon chemistry that can do this trick. So maybe this is the only path to, to life. So these worlds, Enceladus, uh, Europa, are out for an origin of life. And Dave and my work is the inconvenient truth for our colleagues <laughs> on the missions to go and sample these worlds. Because we argue life can't start in those deep oceans under any circumstances. So it's, it, it's happy collegial debate at the meetings. But it's challenging. We are now challenging them because they're just assuming if there's water and there's maybe some heat activity, then there must be life. Well, can it start there, though? If it can't start there, it's really hard to imagine it getting inoculated later. It's a different kind of a mission. So we're looking for hot spring stromatolites. This is from Australia. These are ash-preserved stromatolites, volcanic ash. That's that famous hot spring one on the cover of Scientific American. That you can run your finger over that white line, that white sort of speckly line. That's the geyserite in Australia with an Australian 50 cent piece. Uh, geologists are always putting weird things in, in, their, in their pictures. And that's a piece of the, the, the geyserite. So what about other implications? So we're looking for life on other worlds. What about life extending itself from our world. So if we they say don't find life on Mars through all these missions and life can't be on Venus and it can't be on Jupiter or something, what about if we extended life to other worlds? And that's been a, a dream for a long time. This was the vision of that in 1952 from Werner von Braun and Chesley Bonestell in, uh, in Collier's magazine. They thought, well, this is what it'll be. There'll be rotating space stations and winged spaceships. And this is how we'll go to Mars, if we can avoid the next recession. Uh, we'll have these tankers, and yeah, that's the ticket. And then Disney started funding all this, and Disneyland was partially based on, on this, to Space Mountain and everything. Disney was really into this. This led to Sputnik in 1957, and then the space race. And, but von Braun was really uh, prescient, we'll show you how. So in 1968, Stanley Kubrick made a film called 2001 Space Odyssey, and predicted that by 2001 we'd have winged spaceships going to big Hilton hotels in, in orbit that were... When I saw this in 1972, my little nerd brain was calculating the dimensions of those, those trusses and that, that big base block ring, and it had to be one part, and I said, it can't fit in that shuttle cargo bay. This thing was built by individual launches of heavy lift, and it was a thou I, I computed it was over a thousand launches. I thought, that just makes no sense. It's like the bundle of molecules, like figure out how we build a copy of ourselves. Like no one would pay for that. So I was bothered by this. This is about 1973. I was bothered by that has to be built in space. How do we do that? So how we built a space station, it took much longer. We built one for three, four, five people called the International Space Station. That's its relative size, finished in 2011 at great cost. But all the parts built on Earth. So in the meantime, <laughs> this was me and Kamloops uh, drawing my, uh, my incredibly fanciful spacecraft. Uh, these were called weird machines, and it was about a four-year process of drawing these things out, hundreds and hundreds of these. But at the same time, I was doing talks on space. So this is me at Caribou College in 1980 or 81. This is from the... This is from Jan Ripple from the 210 Express in Caribou College in the student newspaper. And this is a talk I was doing all those years ago. I got my hair's longer. No, it's shorter. I don't have a beard, okay. <laughs> hair's in different place. <laughs> but I had a stripy shirt, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so I was doing this talk about the coming space shuttle program. And I was doing articles for Mel Rothenberger in the Kamloops 
Daily News. And this was a four part series. And this was the fourth part, which was asteroid mining, solar sails and, and stuff like this. And I did all the drawings. Uh, so this is, I was putting it out there, like, let's try to architect this thing. And I was even doing these studies of reaction mass capture and sending them off to NASA and the Space Studies Institute and Gerard O'Neill. And I would get these letters back. <laughs> this is before email, guys. You had to send a piece of paper in something called an envelope and it would come back in another envelope and you'd open it up and you'd be all excited, but it would take months. Anyway, we get these letters back, uh, Johnson Space Center. Thank you for Bruce Damer, 112 Aerostone <laughs> Drive, Cam Loops. Thank you for your letter of July with NASA. So, but yeah, and there's an idea for a space station. But it led to this. So by 1999, I was getting contracts from NASA because I could, our team could build virtual worlds and they were really interested in that. We could simulate spacecraft. So there, there I am at the training facility at uh, Johnson Space Center. So after about 15, 20 projects for NASA, they kept funding us and funding us and funding us. In 2007, a, a bunch of civil servants came to the house and said, we need help. I said, what do you need help for? We have no imaginations. We're civil servants. <laughs> it's beaten out of us. You have an imagination, right? We, we, we just follow the rules, you know, we're civil servants. So. Uh, we need you to figure out how to send people to an asteroid. So I, they sat in my living room and I sketched it out because in my head was the entire solar system, all the missions, all the hardware and parts. It was just on call. I said, this is how we would do it. And they said, fine. And so we did the entire trade study for the administrator and in, in, in headquarters. And this is how the mission came out for the Orion crew coming, pushing into the surface of the asteroid, tethering down, the crew coming out when they're safely tethered down. This is virtually no gravity on an asteroid. It's not like the moon or anything. And then of course, you can take a selfie. <laughs> the, the great moment is the first selfie taken uh, these days. So uh, it, then what we decided to do is push it out to the media. So the two star general I was working for said, why don't you announce it? I said, well, why, did, why should I announce it? You're not a civil servant, you can't get fired. <laughs> Because the internal civil servants and the external scientists wanted to change NASA's direction and they used me. So this was my design and so I put it out to the media as though it was NASA's uh, actual plans. And it went out in 2007 and then everybody started talking about it and it was NASA's plans. Because the, these organizations don't have a brain, right? There's no central brain going like, uh, did we actually think that before? We must have, <laughs> you know. So then it led to missions like Osiris Rex and things. It was a lot of fun to steer an agency. We realized you can steer these agencies with these kind of careful things that everyone buys into. So at the meantime, uh, this man down below, Elon Musk was trying to steer NASA in another way by building reusable rockets, which he's done brilliantly. The man up above named Robert Bigelow, who's a big hotel guy in Las Vegas, created these inflatable uh, space station habitats. One of them stuck onto the station right now. So they were doing something called new space. Elon has this idea of launching this huge giant cruiser like thing, not just launching his Tesla car to space, but, uh, and going to Mars and other places and going well, landing on Mars. And like, this is Elon's idea, Elon Musk, but where are they going to get the resources? It's the same problem as that Kubrick space station. If to lift everything, including your water, your fuel, your food, it's so costly. And so I'm connected with his board members at SpaceX, having uh, every two months I have these big debates. Like, and I finally got the information out of them. How much are you gonna spend to lift a thousand tons of water to space for a Mars mission? And they said, well, we'll spend like three, four billion dollars. Let me show you an alternate way. The alternate way for years had been this idea of asteroid mining, because these things are floating out. You know, they have organics in them. This is from one. They have water in them. They have metals in them. So why don't you just mine them? But most of the companies that were established to do, to look at this, didn't understand about mining. And as a kid, I'd spent time out at Afton Mine. I'd ridden in haul trucks. We'd gone through the smelter. We'd just gone out there and we'd seen how difficult it was to do mining and to process bulk rock material. It's like really complicated and stuff was breaking all the time. So I was like, do they understand that 
you can't bolt buildings onto an asteroid that has no gravity and move stuff down conveyors. Like, no, none of these people talk to mining engineers. You can't put a cable around something that has loosely consolidated boulders that will come off and crash into things. So this is like a fail, right? So these, these enterprises fail because they never even brought experts in to tell them that what they were proposing wouldn't work. So, but what if one night, if you looked up in the sky and there was a comet that had been going past the Earth and it got caught in the Earth-Moon orbital system and it was orbiting around. And this, this actually occurred to me talking to a lunar mining expert friend of mine named Brad Blair. And I said, Brad, what if this happened? Then you wouldn't have to necessarily land on the moon and dig up stuff to find water ice. He said, yeah, that would be the most valuable piece of property in the solar system. Every spacefaring nation would try to get control of it. And I said, what would they do? They would put a fabric enclosure around it, lower the temperature, and then start harvesting and build a giant fuel station. So I said, well, why don't we learn how to do that? So this is about 10 years ago. So I started drawing it out. This is, here's my cartoons again. Cartooning is very valuable, let me tell you. And I started coming up with these notions of fabric enclosure with an asteroid inside to introduce gas and change the temperature and start melting things and getting the water out. And then I showed it to, at a conference, to this man on the upper left, Peter Janiskins. I showed it on my phone. I said, what do you think of this? He said, it'll never work. And I thought, uh-oh, who are you? And he said, I'm a meteor astronomer. If there's a fireball in the sky, my phone rings and I go and pick up the pieces. I said, I am busted. You know, this is an actual expert. So we, he said, ah, oh, don't worry about it. Your, your great idea. We'll go out and have a bowl of clam chowder. So we went out and have a bowl of clam chowder. And at the end of the bowl of clam chowder, he's like, I figured out how to make it work. And we walked back to the conference and he said, what we do is introduce gas. We take gas to the asteroid, envelop it, put the gas in, in the enclosure, and the asteroid will start to interact with the friction of the gas and it'll stop rotating. We can use the gas to turn it and move it around and do stuff. It'll work. And I said to him, is this new? He said, this is totally new. This is a radically new idea. And he rang up his friend, Julian Knott, who I'm sad to say passed away two days ago. It's very emotional. Um, he's the wor world's greatest living balloonist. He, he invented modern ballooning. He died in a ballooning accident in Santa Barbara just two days ago. So he and I worked for a month to come up with this design in 2014 to propose it to NASA with air beams and things. But I just want to dedicate this little section to, to Julian. So let's, let's take a look uh, at how this would work. So this is Shepard. So we're all the way out to an asteroid. We're, we have our mouth of fabric open that we pushed out. We're moving in close, getting it inside the enclosure, centering ourselves so we don't touch it. You don't want to touch these things, they'll tear you apart. And then we push the air beams out down to a seal closure, which will wrap a, a tight bond cell sealing fabric seal it off, and then we start pumping in xenon gas in this case. And the asteroid stops tumbling. Less than 24 hours, a thousand ton object stops. And then we can turn it and we can push it. We can do a sailing ship thing to it. So it'll actually tack uh, around a bit. And then we push it with the gas, recycle the gas, and then fire out the end and, and keep the whole system coupled together. And we can move these things all over the solar system. So that's Shepard. We've just formed a company to now commercialize this to develop it. So the first application was delivering asteroids into lunar orbit. So take a look at this. We've, for two years, we've been driving this with solar propulsion and the gas, and we've released it in lunar orbit. And geologists can now come and take samples. This was what NASA wanted to do, pristine samples of, for the origin of life research, really, too. Here, here's a, from a cover of a magazine. And what, what other asteroids would we go to? We'd go back to things like that original comet that I showed you earlier. Because you can see all those jets coming off? That's water ice that's evaporating. That's what makes up comet tails. All those kinds of things called volatiles. Here's another one that has stuff blowing off of it as it rotates. Here's another one that fell in, in Oregon that is uh, metal, metallic. It's full of nickel and iron. In fact, in Quebec, the great big nickel mines, 
that are in Quebec, they're all from a big asteroid impact. So we're already using nickel from asteroids. So let's take a look at what we can do. If we can encapsulate these objects, we, first thing we can do is take fuel out of them. So here's a, a great big icy uh, dirt ball, basically, that we put the gas in and we start to heat the interior of the, of the enclosure and all the jets will come off and we just pull all that material into tanks. And this is mostly water, but then we start cracking the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Now we have a fuel and we'll have CO2. We'll have all kinds of, of chemicals we need. And then that, that little block section can be self-powered and take it somewhere in the solar system and refuel a Mars mission. So here's the, for the metal parts, this is how we solve the problem of Stanley Kubrick space station. We have a metallic asteroid in the enclosure. We introduce what's called carbonyl gas, which is just carbon monoxide, and an electric field across the, the body, and it will pull metal ions out and plate it, basically 3D printing on any shape you want, an atom at a time, and make parts. Great big parts, trusses, beams, cylinders, everything. We can 3D print in space without grinding, without doing anything, just gas extraction. And this is my favorite of all. This is the biosphere variant. So instead of just taking all that, that water out and putting it in tanks, we leave it in the enclosure as a big, blo a big globule. So like a fishbowl or like one of those glass globes where you have a couple of shrimp and they've been around for 50 years and all they need is light, the sealed glass globes, just like this. And so you introduce uh, biota into here and you can now farm more like fish in space and feed enormous populations by making new worlds. So here's how it would work. You send out your shepherd, your shepherd fuel or miner or bio way out past Mars, grab something past the snow line. It's kind of like when you see out in the Bachelor Hills and there's still snow up there. That's because it's cold enough to have frozen water and further down it's all, it's all evaporated. Same thing past Mars. There's asteroids that are snowy but the ones further in are just, just, just too hot and the water is gone. So you have to go collect your snowball. You bring it into Mars orbit, make your fuel, fill up your fuel tank, send off your Earth crew, because when it gets to Mars, it just simply swaps out one tank for another. And now it has a return fuel and it can go all over Mars. So unlike the Martian where they went to one place and had a screw up, and then had to leave. It's a dumb way to go to Mars. The smart way is to live in space in a clean environment and then take lots of missions down. That's probably the, the better Mars scenario anyway. And when we come back to building something like Stanley Kubrick's space station, we're building the parts in space. We're just 3D printing them and attaching them. And we're supplying water and fuel and for everything that they need for larger space habitats and of course, shrimp burgers, you know. <laughs> to get used to shrimp burgers, or tofu burgers maybe. Uh, so it's a sustainable way to stay in space. And what you end up with, this whole thing is a massive highway system or rail system in space that can support the expansion of the biosphere and human life outside of the Earth. So I would say that you know, starting from Caribou College here, TRU's great origin, uh, that the future is realizable. And if, you can, if you're a kid that has a dream in the sagebrush hills and you stick with it and you keep following it, the universe will keep sending you the, the little stepping stones. You can get there. And so for Werner von Braun's question, can we get to Mars? We can go to Mars and we can go everywhere else. And here's our little, our little shepherds. We solve the problem you know, 60, 60 years later. So there's a, here's an important fourth impl implication. You may want to, you're probably asking, why is this guy talking about the origin of life four billion years ago, and then he jumps without any introduction to, you know, space. You know, what in the earth is? How is that connected? They are connected. So about a year and a half ago, I sort of woke up in bed thinking, why am I working on these two things? And then I realized, oh, in the 70s, I was really concerned about the earth and what humans were doing, because that was the eco movement was just starting then. And we thought, oh, we're doing so much damage, which we are and still are. Uh, how do we preserve life? Because in a sense, nothing can slow down human consumption, human consumption of energy and materials. It's nothing slowing the, putting the brakes on it. 
even if our population stabilizes, we're still gonna want a new smartphone every two years. We're gonna want all this material. So even if our population was declining, we're still consuming vastly more every year. You know, every cup we throw out, every cappuccino, you know, every time we go to Tim Hortons, we're taking stuff out of the system, you know, me included. So I was thinking when I was younger, like, well, if it's not a given that we can actually slow our pace of consumption, what's the only other option? We have to expand the biosphere. We have to extend it and give it more place, more place for humans to grow, and then humans will carry life to other worlds. So that became my tool, two purposes when I was a teenager. And I woke up about a year and a half ago realizing I've been working on the same problem for all these years. It's all the, sing the single solution, encapsulation. Remember those protocells that are like lipid membranes? They go around the, the polymers and they allow them to interact and start to evolve. It's the same thing as the, the balloon fabric enclosure around the asteroid, which uh, introduces a gas and allows things to start happening. It's the same technology. So the technology of life's beginnings is the technology of its extension into the cosmos. So let's kind of take a look at that a little bit. So life, including all biospheres, any biosphere, whether it be a cell or even the entire Earth, if you consider sort of the Gaian biosphere, is always seeking a way to reproduce. And perhaps we are the mechanism for Gaia to reproduce. And if we have achieved that new understanding that our purpose is to help life go on into the universe, you know, we're such a rare example of complex life, and that we now know that we started with the selection of trillions of little compartments and some of them becoming functional and it lift itself up as a system. We can do the same thing in the solar system. We can create trillions of compartments around all these objects in the solar system and it will look like the origin pool itself because it'll allow life to actually lift itself up into space in, in trillions of, of individuals. You know, a huge new future for life. So if we, we started here in our wet dry cycling, you know, our little model, we see it working chemically. Then through intellect, through evolution and intellect and engineering and just basic gumption, we managed to fly something like this in 10, 15 years. We're gonna get there by servicing satellites. That's our, our business model. What this is, the first biosphere that we make is duplicating this biosphere. So this is Earth making another Earth through us. The Earth reproduces just like, oops, it's probably not gonna run, just like when cells divide, look the same. And I wanna go back to Stephen Hawking who passed away last year. One of the things that he said uh, about four or five years ago was, our only chance of long-term survival is to not remain inward looking which we are kind of a lot of this doing these days on planet Earth, but to spread out into, I would say, new frontiers in space. If we want to continue beyond the next hundred years, our future is in space. So I will leave you with that, uh, with a thanks to TRU. So when I started at TRU, there was Old Main, there was the science building was brand new, the gym next to the science building where we did our exams, uh, there was the original cafeteria and the original library, and that was it. And then there were portables. That, that was it. And there was this guy. <laughs> he seemed to be all around, but he's not a caribou. <laughs> so he's an imposter. Get out, you know, you're not a caribou. You're trying to take over. Uh, anyway, but he was, he was around. And now we've got this. I mean, look at this amazing new, new old main, right? Uh, I was just stunned that, to learn from Tom that this is actually the shape of Mount Paul and Mount Peter. And if you go on the other side, it's Mount Dufferin. What a beautiful vision. Look at what we've been able to do in this time period. Look at the progress that we're making and the beautiful things we can do. I'm very optimistic about the future. You know, it, because humanity is endlessly creative. We're endlessly positive, really. Uh, we just have to change the stories we listen to. Some of those negative stories are not doing us any good uh, because we're actually very good at what we do. And I think we have a very brilliant future. So uh, with that, I wanna thank you and close with a, a little uh, statement from Chief Seattle, which was, 
If you damage the web, the web of being, the web of life, you damage yourself. And in a way, elders like him and Chief Dan George, who was very important to our family, my father would go for counsel to Chief Dan George in the 1940s in, the, in, um, in Burnaby or in Coquitlam. And Chief Dan George came to our school, North Campbell's Elementary, when I was 10. I remember him on the stage saying, I, I grew I was born in a longhouse. I was born in a longhouse, and I grew up. And then the white man was coming in, and our, our society just changed. Everything just changed so fast. And he adapted so quickly. He ended up in Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman. He's an amazing fellow, right? Beautiful poetry that he read. And he was a huge inspiration to me, just seeing him giving us his wisdom from, from another world, the world of, in a sense, the Upper Paleolithic, but a highly advanced world of the Salish nation, right? And that that had been preserved. It hadn't been totally destroyed. And to some degree, we have to listen to their voices now. Like the voices of, of Chief Seattle saying, the web is where it's at. The web must be preserved. And what he was saying was what we're now discovering in this science, which was there was never competing individuals as our ancestor. Our ancestor is a web of being and a community, a common community. So with that, I just want to leave you with that, that thought that uh, Western reductionist science can find truths, but it can also find truths for our spirit and our philosophy and our way we think of ourselves. And I'm hoping that this new idea allows us to do that. So uh, thank you very much for your attention today. And we could, I think we can take questions unless I'm vastly over time. And if... If we have a microphone, I can hand it out as well. I'll repeat the question. And has Precious the Stromatolite made its way around? Uh, oh, there's a question here. We'll hold the rock. Do we have another? Oh, we have a second mic. This is good. Thank you. Question. First question. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, an amazing presentation, just uh, extraordinary. Um, I am not a scientist. I just I'm an environmentalist, if you will. Um, I would like to try and understand if you could give me a comparison between the stromatolites that you saw in Australia and the ones the, the uh, um, microbial lights that we've got right out here in Pavilion Lake. I also would like to know. Um, if you think that you're looking at the precursors of carbon-based life right here, aren't you, for your, 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 your experiments, what about precursors to other base life? Like, I understand there may be uh, um, sulfur-based life in the, the black smokers off our coast and so on that may have a different, a, a, a similar origin, only a different endpoint. So the... Um the interesting thing is one is a very local question, which is, uh, what, what's the name of the lake where they found the stromatolite? Pavilion. Pavilion Lake. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing because you have microbialites, stromatolites, these towers here, and you have them under the ice in Antarctica too, and it's, it's amazing to see the ancient Earth, really, in a way. I know NASA's done, done work there. We've only done work in Australia, but, but the, the reason you have stromatolites is because there's nothing to graze on them. Because when grazing animals rose, they crunched through the microbial Eden and crashed it. They crashed the microbial Eden because they were, it was defenseless microbial mats. So as soon as a worm arose that could chew through, it crashed out. So when we see them in places like Shark Bay or, or, or in the lake, it's because there's nothing eating them. <laughs> now the second question is, we've ne the answer have we found other forms of life using just different chemistries? We've never found anything that isn't tightly uh, associated in current life and that uses the same genetic code. We've never found anything that, that is sort of alien to us. And the, the discussions we're having at the astrobiology meetings, which was, can, an, can another form of life emerge that has different DNA and RNA and different polymers? Definitely. Not on Earth. We've never found it. 
could have, have emerged on Mars definitely could have. We just don't, we don't know because we don't have any samples. Can we do something in the laboratory that becomes like a faded primordial version of an alternate way to have life arise? P possibly. But that's a lot of chemistry and a lot of huge number of experiments that we've never been able to do. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably unlikely. I think you probably got to use carbon chains everywhere. It's just, they're the thing that, that works well. You know, nothing can beat carbon in making polymers. Uh, next question. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, I'll be right over. Just make sure when you're talking to the microphone, you have to hold it quite close. Switch mics. Switch mics. Yeah, let's oh, the loud one, the soft one. So is it possible that we could create new life on other planets, like some sort of life seed? That's a very good question. And in fact, when we, could we create new life on other planets as a life seed? Um, probably it's really difficult, say on a place like Mars, because it's, it's high ultraviolet on the surface and super dry and perchlorates in the soil. So in Mars, in order to get an algae to work, we have to go under the ice and how, have, it, have access to sunlight, but be protected by the ice. So it would be quite a project to, to put, get Earth life to actually take on Mars as a challenge. So our intermediate step is to do it the easy way, which is to encapsulate an asteroid full of amino acids and water and things like that, and just inoculate and make a fishbowl. So it, pretty much in 24 hours, um, well, we can take we can take ground up versions of that powder and put it in a Petri dish and life starts to eat it. So a great big asteroid that has a thousand tons of organics in it uh, and is surrounded by a globule of water, you just inject your biosphere and it will just come alive and light it with light from the interior. So that's pr possibly the way to, way to do it. I don't know about engineering, we'll probably engineering uh, some of that to be optimal for high ultraviolet radiation or something? That's a good question. How do you do that first step? Maybe we'll do one more question if anyone has one. Thanks, Bruce. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I'm just sitting here having little sparks running off in one direction or another direction for all the things that you've raised and, and stated. I, the thing that, uh, and I have many questions, but the one thing that uh, I wondered about and you're thinking on it was, I see your model is based somewhat like the infinite number of monkeys and the infinite number of typewriters. And I, I look at the um, complexity First of all, I recognize that we're talking about many, many millions of little pools and because no one pool can do the whole work that, because they'll be wiped out at some point or other and be replaced by others. I'm wondering about your thinking of, of other parts of the Milky Way, other planets and all these exoplanets. I'm thinking about do you see, I mean, it seems to make it absolutely obvious that there, is, there are other planets with life on them in, in our galaxy, let alone the universe. So the, the, the question specifically is, what about life elsewhere in, say, Earth-like worlds? They call them sometimes terrestrial planets, and we're in the golden age of that. I mean, it's amazing, from the 70s we went the golden age of solar system exploration into the 90s, in 2000s now with the Pluto mission and you know landings on on asteroids and samplings we're still in that golden age but now we can see all these thousands of solar systems out there and work out how many of them have rocky worlds small earth like size because a huge gas giant is unlikely to support life we think that you need surface water for long periods of time and surface landscapes and that's not a given so our solar system is, is a, a good example of that. Venus has just too much sunlight. If it had oceans, they evaporated into the atmosphere 
the hydrogen was blown off and it's a CO2 blanket and it's 90 bar and it's 500 degrees at the surface. That's one that's too, porridge that's too hot. <laughs> and then Mars is too cold because it didn't have the magneto magnetic dynamo to protect it so the atmosphere is stripped off and everything dries out and gets cold. And so it couldn't keep liquid water beyond about 700 million years. And then you have the Earth in the middle. In a why did Earth have liquid oceans of substantial size and climate and rainfall and glaciation that went on for three billion years, you know, to allow life to get up the complexity curve and go through the happy accidents. It's I think it's extraordinarily rare, and I think it's mainly based um, due to the very large moon we have, which is created by a rare impact event, probably, because it's oversized, and it was sort of a protector. It was a sentinel, and in fact, if the moon was slightly bigger and or slightly smaller would have created a precessionary wobble in the Earth's orbit, which wouldn't have been good for life. It's almost like if you added up all the things that had to occur for complex life on this planet, the probability is so low for it rising, even eukaryotes, even algae, because it took so long to get there. And then to have intelligent life arise that asks the question of where it arose is ex exquisitely rare, I think. So we may have lots and lots of microbes in hot rocks that are in refugia, that are in protected areas under dead surfaces, like we think maybe Mars has, but we have very little complex life in a biodynamic planet after 4.5 billion years. I think it's exquisitely rare. So in some sense, if we, if we can kind of realize that, we can take better care of the, the rare occurrence that we are. It's just coming to an awakening about that. So I don't know if that's a good, complete answer or not. It's a guess. Yeah, that's outside my pay grade. <laughs> so uh, I think we had one other plan, which is to convene in Tom's office, the few people who wanted to, to do so. And if you want to take a whiff of this, uh, the oldest vintage, on the planet, you're welcome to come up. But I want to thank you all again for your attention and, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. You can reach me at that email address up there is good. Uh, if you want a, any papers, there's a lot of video materials. Uh, we're constantly doing new stuff and new field work. And if you want to aim at this, working in this field of astrobiology, write to me. I can send you guidance, papers. You know, it's a fantastic exploding field of, of science. It's a multidisciplinary field and would love to help guide any of you toward careers there. So thank you very much. So on behalf of Thompson Rivers University, thank you so much for being here today. It's an honor to have you on campus and an honor to have you as a part of the TRU alumni family. Thank you so much. Oh, we've got to hold it up. <laughs> really.